In the last video about relative intonation, I mentioned a scientist and my friend Bill Cardwell, and I wanted to talk a little bit about Bill and what he brought to the trumpet table in regards to musical acoustics. I was fortunate enough to meet Bill, oh gee, it must have been 20 years ago now, and uh, we became very good friends. I would try to go see him about once a month or so, sometimes more often, sometimes not quite as often. I always go over on a Saturday. He'd always want me to come over in the morning because we'd have to have breakfast first. So we'd go out to IHOP and have a nice breakfast with coffee. Then we'd go back to his house and we'd sit in his office and we'd talk about all kinds of things. We'd solve the problems of the world. We'd talk about trumpets, of course, and mouthpieces. He'd ask me, um, how my playing was going, how work was going, what trends I was seeing in trumpet world, etc. And he was sort of a wonderful guy. And partway through the day, his wife Betty would come in and offer us literally lemonade and cookies. And then the three of us would always go out to dinner in the evening, often to uh, Stuart Anderson's Black Angus because Bill really liked to have a fine steak. So it was a great relationship. And I thought it would be important to, to talk a little bit about Bill Cardwell and what he did. And he was a scientist working at Chevron Oil and a fine Dixieland trumpet player. And as time went on, he started wondering, well, gee, I wonder if I could put together my skills as a scientist with my interests as a trumpet player and design trumpets that were easier to play. So he started studying the literature, and I mean, he really got into it. Uh, for example, there was a very famous musical acoustics book written by Bouas, and it was written in French. And Bill felt that the only way he could really understand it would be to read it in the original language. So he learned enough French so he could read the book in the original French and understand it. He was very serious. After some studies, he realized that the key to developing an instrument that would be easier to play was getting the trumpet as in tune as possible with itself. So in other words, relative intonation. And not only would it be easier to play, but it would sound better. He built a device called the stomatolometer so he could make some basic measurements. And he realized the complexity of the problem and decided that the only way he could solve it was to simplify it. So the way he simplified the problem was he made the assumption that in the playing range, the trumpet and the mouthpiece system was a lossless system. All before him had not made that assumption, and it was that assumption that allowed him to solve the relative intonation problem. And it resulted in his presentation at the American Acoustical Society in 1966, and then his resulting patent in 1973. Now this was a big deal. Here this guy kind of came out of nowhere, did this paper at the uh, Acoustical Society conference, and there were a lot of musical giants there. Earl Kent was there, and Jody Hall, and Bacchus were there. And they were kind of shocked by the whole thing, pleasantly shocked that here this guy had, had, done, the, had done what they'd been trying to do for, for quite a while. And so Bill was now on the scene. And his patent is the first published work that detailed how to design a trumpet from scratch with relative intonation better than the current instruments of the time. Now this got the attention of Arthur Benade, the big daddy of musical acoustics at the time. And partly because of that, and partly because of other correspondence that was starting to happen between Bill and some of the other big names, like I told you about, he realized that human testing wasn't accurate or reliable enough for what he wanted to do, his further pursuits in the trumpet world, and his stomatolometer wasn't enough either. Let's hear Bill talking about the limitations of human testing, in his own words. Everybody that has experimented, uh, their prejudices at some time in the experiment shown through. And uh, so it, it isn't like a self that, that you can where you can get the same result every time with extreme accuracy. You can't. You can't do that in these listening experiments. Um, you get results that are influenced by experience in human, human, uh, and you get results that are influenced by 
how and uh, let's let's be honest you get results that are influenced by how whether or not the experimenter himself would possibly benefit from the results so he built a salpingometer now this device allowed Bill to measure the intonation, the relative intonation, of a trumpet and a mouthpiece and simulate different lip penetrations down to an accuracy of one seventeenth of a percent. That's plus or minus one musical cent. Now Bill believed that the best human ears could discriminate plus or minus five musical cents. So here he had a device, kind of crazy looking, almost out of Doc Brown's lab from Back to the Future, but a device that was five times more accurate than the best human ears. And it was that type of accuracy that he felt he needed to pursue his studies. Now his good friend and colleague Dale Olson managed to hook Bill up with the um, Chicago Norland Musical Instrument Company and Bill was asked by Stuart Zent, the vice president at the time I believe, if Bill could design a trumpet that was not only easier to play but could be easily recognizable from a distance. And Bill said, yeah, he could. And expanding on what he knew from his studies of Blakely, that the bell flare was responsible for the tone of the instrument, and the bell stem was the part of the bell that affected the relative intonation of the trumpet, Bill developed a family of four trumpets going from extremely dark to extremely bright. When Bill passed away, I inherited a set of his trumpets, and I'd like to show them to you today because they're really cool. And let's start with the um, most conventional looking instrument. And before we go on, let's explain that the bell stem starts where it comes out of the first valve casing, wraps all the way around until the radius of curvature changes, and that's where the flare begins. And reminder, the stem is the part of the bell responsible for the relative intonation of the horn, and the flare is responsible for the tone. Of course, it's not just the bell stem. The relative intonation is also related to the lead pipe and the rest of the air column. But as far as the bell is concerned, the stem is the part dealing with the intonation, and the flare is dealing with the tone. So this is a very conventional sounding type trumpet. The other one in the family, Bill called the 3500 hertz. Now these names are based off the cutoff frequencies that he designed into the bells. So here you can see this has a really fast flare rate, it's pretty crazy. And this is the brightest of them all, and it would fit as a, uh, um, a tuning bell onto the same air column. Sorry, this is a, uh, don't try this at home. So it would be able to go on the bell, on the body, so you could change the bell. Extremely bright, more conventional. The darkest of them all, Bill called the 850 hertz, and you can see that this is very flugelhorn-like. This was the darkest of the four bells. And the one in between the standard and the 3500 hertz was the 2000 hertz. Now this was the instrument that was marketed and sold by Olds as the CHR, the custom high range trumpet, and by Reynolds as the ERA, the extended range altissimo instrument. And about 500 of these were built and sold, and if you get a chance to try one, please do. It's a part of trumpet history. It's a great sounding horn, it's easy to play, and it's just simply fun. Now when Bill passed away, uh, we disassembled his salpingometer, but my good friend and colleague Gary Bast has built a modern, simplified version that's just as accurate. Now Gary has similarities to Bill in that he's a fine trumpet player and also an electrical engineer. And he spent some time corresponding and studying with uh, Cardwell as well. And Gary to this day has curated all of Bill's research materials and his correspondence. And Gary still does um, testing, research analysis, and uh, consulting with different people. And I'm fortunate to have him as a friend and a colleague slash consultant. He keeps me honest. Having the knowledge and the, his salpingometer allows Gary to measure and make an intonation plot like you see here. You can see that I've got the low C, the middle C, and the high C labeled just to make things a little easier. But to make it even easier, Bill developed what he called the stretched intonation staff. And as you can see, if a note is scooted to the left, 
it's flat compared to the other notes, and if it's scooted to the right, it's sharp compared to the other notes. Each note has a width of 10 musical cents, so the fact in this example that the notes are all overlapping in the vertical means that they are in tune with themselves below the level of human discrimination defined by Bill as plus or minus five musical cents. Now what Bill Cardwell did was, and those before him, but a lot of it was Bill, he gave us another tool, a tool that we can use if we like for new designs, a tool that we can use to verify existing designs or to try to figure things out. So we don't always use Cardwell's perturbation theory or Cardwell's methods to design new instruments, but we often use it to understand instruments of the past and why they were successful or why they were not, and or to verify current or new designs. So a big thanks to all the really smart and dedicated acoustic researchers, especially my friend and colleague Bill Cardwell, for all they figured out. They set a baseline from which others have been able to further improve the trumpet and the mouthpiece. And we'll speak about that in some further videos. But let's end this video with Bill Cardwell telling us in his own words how he decided to combine his interests to develop trumpets that were better in tune with themselves and easier to play. The easiest way to, to put it together is to say that I happened to fall into a line of work with the uh, helping the seismic guys and they were working with vibration theory and how uh, the, the theory of, of vibrations from multiple sources and in, in uh, reverberant areas and, and uh, the theory of uh, seismic exploration gave a bunch of, uh, of results that were applicable to acoustic theory of other things besides waves in the earth and I applied the things I learned in uh, the seismic work and the math I had to use and in particular um, how you broke all kinds of temporal signals down into their frequency components. In seismic work you took all the seismic signals and you did Fourier analyses of them and that's the way you processed them. And um, I just used a bunch of the seismic theory on the stuff that hadn't been done on the trumpet. Um, that, that had to do with the, the directionality that you applied to multiple sources in seismic work. You could apply that to trumpet work. And um, it, it was it was a an adaptation that hadn't been done. It was putting together two interests. My my interest at work in the uh, processing seismic data, and my old interest in the, in the trumpet. Put, put them together, and that's uh, that's what I did.